Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 4. This is going to be Part 1, and we're going to talk about cell membranes. We'll talk a little bit about proteins, and then we'll talk about resting membrane potential. I mentioned this, uh, I think, in Chapter 2 or 3 when we talked about using ions to set up a potential um, in order to turn into kinetic or energy of motion. So these are the different types of microscopes that we have to identify these structures. So you'll see um, throughout the textbook, they'll have the images labeled. And this is what we can see with a light microscope with some objective lenses and the naked eye. You can see uh, different cells and you can see these uh, tissue layers coming together. And then here are cilia. These are pairs or extensions off of the cell. You need a scanning light microscope to see them in this much detail, and then you need a transmission microscope to see even smaller. So there's different types of microscopes used for studying uh, cellular structures. Cells are going to have a variety of sizes and shapes. So shapes will be on the next slide. This is sizes. They're showing you, um, so just the naked eye, what can you see? With a light microscope, kind of you're in this range. You can see red blood cells, different cell types. We just saw tissue previously, right? And then much smaller, like virus, we can only see those with electron microscopes. So cells come in a variety of shapes, and it usually tells you something about their function. So we can see here the nerve cell. If I have um, information from that I want to get from my brain to a particular area, probably a round shaped cell is not going to not going to work, right? So we have this elongated irregular shaped structure to convey information. Here we have a red blood cell. Red blood cells carry oxygen. They have a very specific shape that allows them to bind oxygen and drop oxygen off. Then we're going to have kind of these more blocky um, shapes and this is going to be good for tissues like building tissues, right? And then here in um, skeletal muscle, there, it's more of a cylindrical shape because the muscle has to contract. We're going to squish this muscle together, and we're going to generate enough force to lift a load. Again, that is probably not going to do it, right? So the shape matters. Here we have the common features of a cell. So all cells are going to have a plasma membrane. If you remember, the plasma membranes were made up of the phospholipid bilayer, right? You'd have a bunch of phospholipids, and they'll form this double layer. Two, all cells are going to have a nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you have it'll house or contain the DNA. And then third, they have cytoplasm. That's the stuff, basically, that's between these two. So let's look at an image. Here's an image of the structure of a cell. You can see that the plasma membrane wraps around. On this side, they're trying to show you that the plasma membrane can fold on itself. So microvilli are like fingers, cilia is like hairs, and flagella, and flagella or flagellum is like a tail. So here's that whip-like tail structure. Um, sperm are the only cells in the human body that have a flagellum, so they're gonna have a head with uh, DNA in it, and then they're going to have this whip-like tail at the end so they can navigate the female reproductive tract. Then we have the nucleus over here, and the nucleus is going to contain DNA. So basically anything between the nucleus and the plasma membrane, that is cytoplasm. And then embedded in the cytoplasm is jelly-like substance. You're going to have organelles and we're going to come back and talk about organelles in the second half of this chapter. Some common functions of cells, they're going to obtain nutrients, they're going to dispose of waste. So sometimes people think of them as kind of mini little factories, right? And if we have cells, cells make up tissue, tissue makes up organs. You have to go back to the list of complexity of structures and complexity back in chapter one, right? So cells are kind of like mini little factories that are obtaining nutrients, extracting chemicals, building things like proteins, and then disposing of any waste from the chemical buildup and breakdown that's happening inside.
and these cells make up tissues and tissues make up organs. So basically if you don't have cells carrying out these general functions then your organs aren't going to work properly. We've mentioned plasma membrane several times and we've talked about phospholipid or the biphospholipid layer that makes up the plasma membrane. But there are also two other um, different types of lipids that we're going to see in the plasma membrane. One is cholesterol. It's kind of wedged into the plasma membrane. And then we're going to see glycolipids. So these are lipids that have glucose tags. So let's skip the next two slides. You can read through in more detail about these components, but let's just go ahead and look at the figure. Okay, let's look at all the parts of a plasma membrane. So we just talked about the three lipids that make up the plasma membrane. One, phospholipids. So we know we have this head with a tail and that we form this bilayer, right? So this is a phospholipid bilayer. That's the majority of your plasma membrane. Remember the tails don't like water. So the tails are hydrophobic, right? Water hating. So they come together and the heads face outside because they're hydrophilic. They don't mind water and there's water inside the cell and there's water outside of the cell. Then the next component of the plasma membrane is cholesterol. You can see yellow. I wish they'd kind of made it a different color because it kind of gets lost in the background there. But cholesterol are these rings of lipids that are shoved into the plasma membrane to help give it stability. And then the third are the glycolipids. So what happens is one of the phospholipids gets tagged with these glucose tags. We also have proteins. Those were the big purple blobs. I didn't mention them because I'm going to talk about them in the next slide or show you the image. We have integral proteins. They're embedded within the phospholipid bilayer or the plasma membrane. And then we have peripheral, which means outside, right? So they're kind of on the border. They're not embedded in the bilayer. Same image as before. You can see the integral proteins, so the proteins that are passing through the plasma membrane. And then on the side here, you can see these peripheral proteins. They just kind of butt up to either the outside or the inside of the plasma membrane. I also want to show you while it's here, sometimes you can have proteins that are tagged with carbohydrates. So just like we had a lipid tagged with glucose, here we have a protein tagged with glucose. So this would be a glycoprotein. Here we have a nice illustration of the different functions of plasma membrane proteins. So you can see they're all embedded in the plasma membrane. These first three all have to do with transportation. So they're transport proteins. You can see they're moving molecules from one side. This is the outside or extracellular. And they're moving it inside, which is intracellular. This is how I know what they're talking about, <laughs> right? All right, so we're moving molecules from one side to the other. Uh, this right here, this cell surface receptor, there are times that we want a molecule to dock and tell the cell what to do. So um, this could be insulin. Insulin is a hormone that can dock a, on a cell surface receptor and signal this cell to take in glucose. We have identity markers. I showed you this image before and I told you it's called a glycoprotein. This can act as a cell tag. Basically, it's how your body knows whether it's your cell or whether it's a foreign cell that needs to be disposed of.
Enzymes, we've talked about enzymes in the last chapter, so I won't go over this again, but you can have enzymes embedded in the plasma membrane that help break down substrates into products. Then we have kind of this anchoring protein. So sometimes we're going to have a cytoskeleton that can bind to this protein and act as kind of like an anchor and give the cell the specific shape that it needs to do its job. And then sometimes if we have two cells and we need them to kind of work together, um, to work in concert, you can see these cell adhesion proteins. So it allows for two cells to um, basically stick together. And we'll talk about some of those uh, different types of junctions that cells can have with each other. We know plasma membranes serve as physical barriers. They regulate the movement in and out of the cell. So we know that a cell has to take in nutrients, right? And we know that the cell gets rid of waste because what's the cell doing? It's doing metabolism. Your cells are constantly breaking down nutrients, extracting the energy out of those nutrients, getting rid of the waste, recycling any of the nutrients that they can use, and then taking that energy and using that energy to have proteins move within the cell to create proteins to copy itself. So this is a dynamic process that's going on. So we need to talk about how do we get items across the plasma membrane. If a cell has to take in nutrients, how does it do that? And that's called membrane transport. There's two processes here listed. These are kind of the big umbrellas. And we'll break down each process and give you some examples. But passive and active, if you hear those words, that should kind of give you an idea already of what we're going to talk about. So if I said somebody was behaving passively, if I said there's a passive child, right, you would maybe think of a child sitting down quiet somewhere by themselves. Not a lot of energy involved. And then if I said, ooh, that's a really active kid, right, you'd be thinking that kid's jumping all over the place and acting crazy, right? <laughs> so active transport requires energy. Passive transport does not. Nice flow diagram here for membrane transport. So we have either a passive process that does not require energy, so no ATP necessary, and we move down our concentration gradient. That means that molecules move from high to low. There's two different examples, diffusion and osmosis, and we'll talk about both of those. We're really just going to focus on simple diffusion. We're not going to get into all the other examples. Then we have active process. Active process requires ATP, so requires energy being put in to start this process. And you're going to move up the concentration gradient. You're going to move from low to high. And we're going to have active transport. We're really going to focus on primary active transport. We're going to talk about a sodium potassium pump. And then we're going to talk about vesicular transport. So this one has more to do with a membrane. Oops, membrane, there we go. So we'll talk about exocytosis and endocytosis and then some of these other subsets of endocytosis. What some people like to think about is the passive process where you're going from high to low, no energy required, would be like floating downstream. You don't have to put any energy in. You don't have to move the paddle. You're just going with the current. And the current is carrying you from where the water is high to where the water is low. Active transport is like you're swimming upstream. You have to put in tons of energy to get past the current or to get through the current because you're going from lower water to you have higher water rushing towards you. So active process would be like swimming upstream and passive process would be like floating downstream. So we're starting with our first example of passive. So this is passive transport. This example is diffusion. So what's passive transport? No ATP and we're moving from high to low concentration. So they're showing you here if I had a dropper full of dye and I dropped that into water, this beaker with water, this is at really high concentration of dye, 
What happens to the dye? It will diffuse out into the rest of the water until it reaches equilibrium. So we went from high and the water the dye molecules went out into the water where the dye was lower. So this is diffusion. An example inside the body is carbon dioxide and oxygen. So we're talking about simple diffusion. We're still under the category of passive. I just gave you an example of diffusion with the dye and the water, but this is a biological example. So what happens in the body? We have oxygen and carbon dioxide, and they're going to diffuse from high concentration to low concentration. No energy is required, no ATP required. This is a good thing. We don't have to waste energy on just getting oxygen into our cells. Here's the waste, carbon dioxide. Guess what happens? It goes from high concentration to low concentration. So when I think of diffusion, I think of the movement of non-charged molecules from high to low concentration, no energy required. Hopefully all that made sense, right? The non-charged part is important. You'll see why as we move through these examples. Osmosis is our second type of passive. So we're here under passive transport. We've already looked at simple diffusion and we gave a definition, so define, and then we gave an example in the body. Now we're here at B, which is osmosis. So remember diffusion was the movement of non-charged particles from high to low. Osmosis is the movement of water. So it's the movement of water from high to low. So on this side, look at all the water molecules. So there are all these red, right? So we have high water over here, and we have relatively low water over here. So the water is going to move from high to low, and what the water is trying to do is equalize or um, dilute all of these ions to make things even on both sides. So you can have glucose molecules, you can have calcium, you could have ions like sodium and chloride, and the water moves to wherever the solute is high. So this side has a high number of solutes. So these guys, one, two, three, four, five, we could go through and count them all, right? There's lots. So high number of solutes. Compared to this side, we have a lower number of solutes. So what is osmosis? It's the movement of water from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water, and the water is always moving to where you have the highest number of solutes until it reaches equilibrium. Here's another figure from your book trying to explain osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. So, but I also want to use it as an example to show you what's going on with concentrations in the solute and water. So first thing, osmotic pressure. When water moves, so the movement of water molecules can cause pressure differences. The next thing the book mentions is hydrostatic pressure, and that's the pressure of the water on the inside of the tube. So this is water causing pressure on the inside of the vessel or container. So we're going to come back and talk about these terms when we get to um, blood flow and um, kind of what causes swelling and cardiovascular health and
how high blood pressure can affect these two pressure differences as water is moving through your system. So they're kind of just laying the foundation now. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about this. We'll come back and talk about it. But now we have to focus on looking at this image and kind of really understanding the difference between solute and water concentration and how um, osmosis is going to try to dilute out the solute. Okay, so on this side, we have higher solute concentration compared to lower water concentration. So what we're saying is, let's say we have eight solutes and we have 12 water molecules. On this side, side B, we have lower solute with higher water. So let's say we have four solutes on this side and we have 16 water molecules on this side. So do you see how this has higher solute? Side A has higher solute compared to side B, and side B has higher water concentration. Okay, so we have this semi-permeable membrane that's supposed to act like our plasma membrane. So over here we have high water compared to solute, and over here we have low water compared to solute. So what did I say is happening if this is still an example of passive transport, we're moving from high to low. In osmosis, water molecules are moving. So the water is going to go from the high side to the low side. What's it trying to dilute out? The high solutes, right? So come over to this image. If we left this uh, side A and B alone for a while, what would happen is osmosis would occur. The water would move from the high side to the low side to dilute out these solutes. So what happened to the water level? Water level went down on side B, but it went up on side A. So we know the water moved from side B to side A. So we know that the water was diluting out the solutes. So these two, even though they don't have the same volume, so not the same volume, not the same amount of water, they're going to have the same concentration of solute to water. So on this side, we're now going to have uh, eight solutes and 16 waters. And on side B, we're going to have five solutes and 10 waters. Those are the same concentration. What's 8 divided by 16, right? 1 half. What's 5 divided by 10? 1 half. So the water has moved across the semi-permeable semi membrane, or our plasma membrane if this was a biological example, and we've diluted out the solutes until the two concentrations are equal. I know right now we're thinking, okay, Miss Nikki, who cares? It's a big deal if we're talking about a red blood cell. So I'm going to show you an example in just a minute, but we have red blood cells. They're supposed to carry oxygen for us, right? Would it matter how much water a red blood cell took on? What happens if a red blood cell just kept taking in water? Water just kept passing through the membrane of the red blood cell. What would happen if your red blood cell lost all of its water? Remember, osmosis is just regulated by high to low water and solute concentration. Right? So wherever the solute is high, that's where the water goes. So we're going to look at isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions, and I'll explain why you should think this is important. First, some basic definitions. Isotonic solution. The inside of the cell and the water that the cell is in have the same concentration. So here's my beaker of water. Here is my cell. What we're saying is the solute concentration out here is equal to the solute concentration inside the cell. So water doesn't have to move. Everything's already at 
equilibrium. So this is a common IV solution. This is what kind of the percentage of salt that is inside of our cells. So salt could be your solute, right? Solute is just the item that's being dissolved. Hypotonic solution is where the solution has a lower concentration of solutes. So here's my beaker. Here's my cell. We're saying out here in the solution, it has low solute. That means compared to the cell, the solute is higher. This is a little dangerous because what can happen to all the water molecules that are out here? So we've got all of our water molecules. Water molecules like to go to where the solute is high and dilute it. So what happens to all the water molecules? They're going to rush the cell. What happens to the cell volume? What happens to the pressure inside the cell? What happens if water just continues to rush or transport across the cell membrane? You can have a cell that'll burst. So the opposite, hypertonic. So we have a container and we have a cell in that container and the solution has a higher concentration. So out here we have high solute compared to inside the cell where the solute is low. So what happens to all of the water that's inside the cell? Remember cells are 60 percent water. All that water is going to go out into the solution. So what's going to happen to the cell? The volume decreases, the pressure decreases, and we have crenation which is cell shrinkage. This is a nice summary slide to show you what's happening to the red blood cells in each of the instances that we just talked about. So why should you care about this? So erythrocytes are red blood cells. Do we know red blood cells carry oxygen? So if you lyse them, right, if, you're, if, you, if your body, if your outside fluid, if your extracellular fluid outside of the cells is hypotonic, or the fluid outside of your cells is hypertonic, you either rupture your red blood cells or you shrink your red blood cells. In either case, they cannot carry oxygen as well. If they lyse, they can't carry it at all, right? What do we need oxygen for? What process did we talk about that generates what? ATP. So it takes about 15 days to make new red blood cells if you destroy all of them. So you're constantly, every day, every second of every day, you're making red blood cells. But if you wiped out a whole bunch of red blood cells at one time, it would take you 15 days to make enough to replace it. So with, if you damage red blood cells, you can't get oxygen. If you can't get oxygen, you can't carry out cellular respiration efficiently. You don't have enough ATP to carry out functions. And remember I said that's all nerves, all nervous cells, so all communication to and from the brain, you need ATP. Your heart, cardiac muscle, your skeletal muscles to move, your smooth muscles to pump blood. All of those require ATP. So no ATP. you die, right? So it is really important to understand osmosis and it becomes more important when we get to cardiovascular chapter because the majority of your blood is water and so we'll talk about those um, osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure differences and why it's important to maintain a certain level of blood pressure. Now we switch gears and talk about active transport. So remember active transport ATP is required and we're moving from low concentration to high. We're swimming upstream. We're going to talk about primary active transport. We're going to use energy from ATP to drive active transport. And what we're going to talk about is the sodium potassium pump. This is going to come up again in the muscle chapter. You might also hear me call this protein assisted active transport. This is what they used to call it. Now they just call it primary active transport, but sometimes old habits die hard, right? So we're going to talk about the sodium potassium pump. This pump is an ion exchange pump. 
And basically, you're going to export sodium out of the cell, and this pump is going to bring potassium into the cell. So it's probably best if we just look at the next image. So we have our sodium potassium pump as our example of active transport. And we said primary active transport. So we know ATP is required, and we're moving from low concentration to high. But we're doing two things at one time. This is a dual pump. So here you can see the ATP is bound to this protein, and we have three sodium ions bound as well. And you can see the energy from the phosphate, because we have ADP and P, we know when we take ATP and break it down to ADP plus P, what else had to come out? Energy, right? So we used the energy to change the shape of this uh, protein so that it opens up and you can see now that the three sodiums have exited the cell. What happens next, two potassiums are going to bind their active site on this protein and the protein is going to change shape again and release the potassiums to the inside. So you're moving both sodium and potassium against their ion gradient concentration and you need ATP for this to happen and you need this protein. Without the protein it's not going to happen. So this is an example of primary active transport. The next type of active process is this vesicular transport. Sometimes you'll hear me say membrane assisted active transport. But we need a vesicle to be created. This is also going to require ATP, and we're also going to be moving from low concentration to high concentration. So we have these two terms. With vesicular transport, we're either going to do exocytosis or endocytosis. So cytosis means cell, exo means exit, right? And endo means enter or inside, right? If we wanted to push something out of the cell, so here's the cytosol, so we know this is inside the cell, and here's interstitial fluid, this is outside of the cell. I know it's kind of confusing because they say interstitial fluid, but remember interstitial fluid is the fluid between cells. So if I have a cell here and a cell here, this is interstitial fluid. Okay, so cytosol tells me this is the inside, we see that there's a vesicle formed, and that vesicle is going to fuse with the plasma membrane, and it's going to dump the contents that were inside towards the outside of the cell. So you can see the vesicle has to be made up of the same components of the plasma membrane, right? It has to be made up of phospholipids, phospholipid bilayer, for it to fuse here with the membrane. So endocytosis, we're going to talk about um, three types, and they're coming up in the, in the next couple of slides. But I also wanted to drive home the point that we're talking about getting rid of really large substances. So we can't just open the plasma membrane and let these really large substances out, or open the plasma membrane and let these really large substances inside. Right, some items might sneak by that we don't want. We could have water gushing through. We don't want that. So these are for really large substances that you need to wrap them in a vesicle in order to assure that they're brought in or out of the cell. In this case, we're going to talk about inside endocytosis. Phagocytosis, so remember we just said this is a type of endocytosis. This is one example. Um, this is inside the cell. This is outside of the cell. And you can see here's an item, a particle, that's outside of the cell, and we want to bring it in. So the plasma membrane forms this vesicle, engulfs this particle, and brings it inside the cell. They're really specific about um, separating out whether it's a particle or whether it's fluid. So just like we saw phagocytosis and we said this was a particle, 
right, some sort of molecule or particle. Now we're talking about penocytosis. The same process happens. The only thing is that the cell is engulfing fluid or solutes and bringing them inside the cell. The third type is this receptor-mediated endocytosis. So there has to be a receptor on the plasma membrane and when the ligand, the item that's binding to the receptor, forms this complex, you can see another one here, so there's always a receptor, there's some sort of molecule or item that has to bind, and once that happens, it'll trigger this vesicle to form, close off, and bring into the cell these molecules bound to the receptor inside this vesicle. Let's do a quick summary. So if I had to start kind of an outline, number one, we have passive transport, right? Passive transport examples. What were the two examples that we saw of passive transport? We saw simple diffusion. I'm just going to say diffusion. And we saw osmosis. So tell me exactly what diffusion is. So define diffusion, the movement of the passive transport, right? The movement of any non-charged molecule across the plasma membrane. So I'm going to draw a plasma membrane over here. Don't ask me to draw all these little phospholipids. I'm not going to do it, right? Okay, so what was the biological example for simple diffusion? We said we have oxygen or carbon dioxide and they can move through the plasma membrane. So passive transport, no ATP required, moving from high to low concentration. What was osmosis if I had to define it? This is water moving from high to low towards high solute concentrations, right? Dilute out the solutes. So this is not any charged molecule. What If we're talking about osmosis, we're talking about water moving from high to low. Okay, then we had two, we have active transport. So A, we had a primary active transport and the example we saw was the sodium potassium pump and then two we had vesicle transport and we saw endocytosis and we saw exocytosis and then for endo we had several subcategories, right? Phagocytosis, penocytosis, receptor-mediated endocytosis. Okay, so what is different about active transport? Active transport, ATP is required, and you're moving from low to high concentrations. So what exactly were we moving in this active transport sodium potassium pump? We were moving charged, right? charged molecules. Except for now, we're moving those molecules from a low concentration against the current to a high concentration. So if I have a charged molecule and I want to move it across a plasma membrane, I probably need one, a protein, right? I got to have a pump, a protein, and two, I have to have ATP. Vesicle transport, we saw endocytosis. This was for very large molecules. Molecules that you don't want to just open a huge section of the plasma membrane and let this item in. You want to bring the item in and wrap it in a vesicle and bring that inside the cell. Exocytosis, you want to go the opposite. You're still also moving from low to high. You're moving to where you have a few of these and you want to move them to an area where you have more. So 
active transport, passive transport, big difference. I would make sure that I can kind of explain through the entire process, give examples, be able to give definitions, and be able to ask yourself some kind of questions like this. What do I need for a sodium potassium pump? What type of transport is it? What are the key factors that I have to have in order for this to take place? What about vesicle transport? To create a vesicle, you have to have what? Right, phospholipids. So hopefully that helped a little bit. I've mentioned this term many, many times, resting membrane potential. We need to talk about it just a little bit more because it's going to be really essential for muscle and nervous cell function. When a cell is at rest, it has a resting membrane potential. There is usually some electrical charge difference at the plasma membrane that sets up this resting membrane potential. So there is an unequal distribution of ions, that's charged molecules, across the plasma membrane. So we're going to see an image in just a second. You're going to see sodium on the outside, and you're going to see potassium on the inside. The outside of the cell has to be more positive, and the inside of the cell has to overall be more negative. So in muscles and neurons, we're going to have a resting membrane potential that's negative. So inside, here's our plasma membrane, inside the cell, it's going to overall be negative, anywhere from negative 70 to negative 90 millivolts, depending if we're talking about a muscle or a neuron. I also want you to look at the different ions. So on the outside of the cell, we have lots of sodium ions. Inside of the cell, we have lots of potassium ions. We have a lot of really large negatively charged proteins which help give us this overall negative resting membrane potential. We have to set this up in order for this muscle to contract. So we're going to learn that these sodium ions are going to move through these proteins embedded in the plasma membrane and that's going to turn potential energy into kinetic energy. So the most important ions are sodium and potassium. They help set up this electrochemical gradient. So right now, I want you to know sodium is on the outside of the cell, like higher numbers of sodium on the outside, higher numbers of potassium on the inside. The inside of a muscle and a nerve are overall negative resting membrane potential. And we have to have this set up in order for muscles to contract and nerves to fire. Why did we have to learn about the sodium potassium pump? If I need to have sodium on the outside and potassium on the inside at rest, and I told you the sodiums are going to come in, what do you think we have to do? If we want to reset our resting membrane potential, if we want to go back to rest after we've contracted, if we brought sodium inside, what do we probably need to do to get back to rest? We need to kick them back out, right? So the sodium potassium pump is working all the time to make sure that the sodiums stay on the outside, the potassiums stay on the inside. Sometimes I tell people it's like resetting the chessboard um, or checkers or football field, right? Whatever, whatever game you want to play. So if you start with sodium on this side and you potassium on this side, if they move to the opposite sides, what do you have to do before you can play again? You have to kick the sodiums out and you have to bring the potassiums back inside. If this was totally confusing for you, we're going to talk about it again and again, and we'll get to it with muscles. Understand the definition of a resting membrane potential, 
understand that the inside of the cell is negative, understand that we're setting up a potential um, energy between the outside and the inside so that we can turn that potential energy. Once we move the ions through the plasma membrane, we can turn it into kinetic energy or movement. So without a resting membrane potential, you cannot have muscles contracting or neurons firing. So hopefully I didn't scare you too much. Muscles are a lot of fun once you figure out how they work, but we have to do a lot of groundwork before we get there. So um, I'll finish up uh, part two. So I'll see you next uh, PowerPoint. Bye.